everyone and welcome to Simplify Payments, a new podcast series presented by Paramount Commerce. I'm your host Varad Mehta. In Simplify Payments, we'll take a closer look at new and emerging financial technologies and practices with industry experts. In our second episode, we'll learn about Canada's crypto landscape with Adam Kai, the CEO of Virgo CX. So please sit back and enjoy the show. Um, so, Adam, how we always begin our podcast is by asking our guests a few fun questions. So I had a couple lined up for you. Uh, and after that, we'll get to the main topic. Um, so the first one I had is that you studied very close to the East China Sea. Uh, first of all, how beautiful is that area where your university was? And they're like small islands really close to the East China Sea. Did you ever get to visit any of them? Uh <laughs> Um, yeah, so I was uh, always spending my university time at Shanghai, uh, China. So it's a definitely a beautiful city, uh, you know, close to the East China Sea. Uh, there is, um, you know, I guess a very modern city, but obviously you have a lot of tourist attractions you can go to kind of feel the nature beauty of things. Um, I personally didn't go to these um, small islands, uh, but I was, um, you know, mainly. I was spending time there within the city. I would say there's a lot to check out already. So uh, maybe next time when I go back to uh, Shanghai, I will, you know, check out those small islands. I envy you because where you studied, that's a beautiful area. I looked it up on the map. There's like water bodies all over it. So I was like, Adam is doing really well. I was like, that looks really fun. Uh, <laughs> my second fun question for you, Adam, is that if you were a shark on Shark Tank, or a dragon on dragons, then which shark or dragon would you prefer partnering up with? Oh, that's another amazing question. So I, I'm actually uh, actually a pr- pretty big fan for you know dragons den or shark den. Then back then, back into the school when I was studying uh, at Ivy Business School. Um, so obviously, this is a, a very interesting business show um, talking about helping entrepreneurs to get. Raising capitals and the, most sharks are pretty sharp. Let me put it that way. Uh, so, uh, like for me personally, like I like I like I enjoy hearing Kevin Alari talk. Like he's a pretty nasty guy, like on the show. But I heard that he's a pretty nice person off the show. <laughs> but um, maybe just like the dramatic theme of the show. Uh, and there's also an, another lady I should particularly like. Is, I think her name is called Elaine. Okay, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, she she is a big marketing guru. Mm-hmm. I think she's pretty logic, very sharp. And I think, you know, it's, um, she's pretty good, I would say, like a mentor to us if we're ever given a chance to help us to, you know, obviously have a better marketing and all, everything. I think she's a pretty good partner. I would like to learn for sure. I think with your story, I think Adam should be, a dragon or a shark. So if folks are listening, please get Adam on that program. Um, now moving on to the topic of the day, um, you know, trying to understand the crypto landscape of Canada. I think you being an expert and, you know, having years of, you know, expertise in this field, I think we would love to get your views and, you know, expertise on this. Um, so I'd like to start out by, you know, Virgo CX is so well-versed within the crypto regulations throughout the world. Can you just briefly describe uh, maybe the regulatory environment for crypto exchanges within Canada. How do how do they work, and what is it all about? Sure. Um, so I think Canada it is actually leading the world in terms of defining such a challenge landscape, like you know trying to provide regulatory guidance and the clarities as to how you should run crypto exchange. So I think Canadian regulator has done a great job on that. So since two thousand twenty. One, I think we're already starting to work with the security administrators all across Canada, um, you know, trying to define what is the, you know, I guess the industry rules and I'll try to work with them, trying to work with us, uh, you know, to provide, you know, obviously guidance for us and all, as well as for us to submit application to them. So within Canada, first, first thing comes first, any exchanges that custody clients assets working as a central exchanges, you know, doing the auto book, stuff like that has to, has to certainly, you know, uh, get the 
uh, the, the 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 restricted dealer license from the security commissaries, and also uh, very soon, I think all the exchanges will fall under ARC. Now it's called zero uh, zero supervision. Um, so this is a very tight, uh, I would say, regulatory body. Um, you know, overseeing all the dealers, brokers, right, for that purpose. So I think Canadian does provide a very clear guidance and uh, how you should play by the rule books. So obviously, we have been doing that since 2022, May the 31st, when we get actually get registered as one of the dealer, restricted dealer with um, Ontario Security Commissions and all, 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 all the provincial security commissions across Canada. So I think this is a... Um, uh, uh, great, you know, trying to protect investors to now to see another FTX event, now to see another Quadriga CX event. Uh, you know, in the end of days, no matter how much money you make in the crypto world, if the principle cannot be protected, uh, then this is useless, right? So I think this is uh, very important. We're seeing certainly really positive things on the industry movement in Canada. No, interesting. Um maybe when you've traveled outside and studied other markets, do you see like differentiating factors between what Canada is doing for crypto versus what other countries are doing for crypto? Yeah. Like I think let's just pick a few markets. Actually we enter, right? So we uh, entered Australia um, uh, some time ago, um, actually uh, last year. Um, so um, for the Australian market, um, into some regulatory uh, regulatory body currently still under Austrac, which is equivalent to FinTrack in Canada, which is already super supervising the anti money laundry activities. So I think that is still a little bit lighter uh, when it comes to the regulation compared to security regulations in Canada. Um, and when it comes to US, obviously, uh, SEC now is being pretty hostile to the industry. I don't think they are in a position to provide. A clearer guidance anytime soon for the crypto exchanges. Um, so right now in US, you're probably still looking at, you know, MSB and the FinCEN and each state you're talking about. Some state need MTR license, some they don't, depending on each state's regulations. So I think when if you do like look at Hong Kong, uh, they're now introducing the you know the new rules for the virtual service, uh, virtual asset service providers, obviously also provide that kind of clarity, trying to run centralized exchange over there. Uh, so I think in a world, uh, uh, if you look from a world perspective, uh, I think the future direction will be the central exchanges has to be defined as a financial service company uh, because you have to really just protect user assets. I don't think uh, an money laundry itself is enough. You really need to have that accountabilities uh, for the company. Uh, so I think that will be the future trend and we're well positioned uh, for such evolved evolutions because we're already actually ready for that. Nice. Um, maybe going away from the regulations, have you noticed any trends within the Canadian crypto market? You know, there were some crypto exchanges who probably, you know, moved out of Canada or ended their offerings within the Canadian market. Like what sort of trends have you noticed? Um, maybe just like the example I gave. Right. So the main reason for a lot of global players to exit in uh, Canada are two things. One is uh, it is pretty difficult for them, obviously, to uh, to to get licensed in Canada, considering, I would say, what I call the historical liability. Uh, it's uh, quite a bit of, uh, uh, I guess, legacy issues they have to resolve. Uh, so the second thing is, there's a big discussion currently going on on the state of stable coin regulations in Canada. Um, so USDT currently is banned, unfortunately, for all the centralized exchanges in Canada. But for mo most global players, the, the majority of trading volumes are against USDT pairs. Obviously, they're not going to be able to do it uh, without USDT. Uh, so that's also another, another lim limiting factors. Uh, so I think... Um, yeah, like I think in terms of the industry per se, um, I think the regulation is providing good guidance. But in the meantime, the industry ecosystem is trying to ask more now from the regulator saying that, OK, you know what, when can we, you know, extend potentially, you know, the, the I guess, the accepted crypto assets, which is currently the only one that do not have 
trading limit, uh, BTC, ETH, LTC, and BCH. But like obviously, there are a lot more cryptocurrency people would like to trade more, right? So I think that will need some discussions with regulators and when that can be broadened. And also in terms of, you know, there's a lot of discussion about how to protect investors away from, you know, major losses um, and, the, you know, all those, I guess, anti-scam, anti-spam, like there's a lot of trend over there. So it's, you know, quite a bit of challenge movements, especially actually in the bearish market. You just see these people now emerging, trying to really take advantage of the fragile e ecosystem. Uh, so we just have to take positions to protect our users. Yeah, I think you sort of um, answer what my next question is going to be. But <laughs> do you see any challenges for crypto exchanges who are or who want to uh, establish a business within Canada? I think you really said that the regulations are tightening up. Uh, you know, there's rules that you have to play by. Um, there's probably limited offering for consumers. So what specific challenges are there for crypto exchanges who are currently operating, such as yourself, or who want to establish their business within Canada? Right. So basically the barrier of entry right now for the crypto business in Canada is becoming very hard. Um, so it's no longer like it's just two-man shop can run it. Not possible. You actually have to have a strong compliance structure, strong legal team, strong tech team, like auditing all the way through. Uh, and also you have to also get to SOC auditing as well uh, to have the data privacy, preservation, like, and all kinds of that stuff. So it's actually like technically speaking, it's just launch a financial service company now. So it's, the value of entry is pretty high. Um, but the other thing also very important way is the business opportunities, right? So within the current the landscape for Canada, uh, which is only allowed is the spot trading, right? So as we all know, the crypto trading space, the major volume does not come from spot. It accounts for derivatives, right? You talk about margin trading, perpetual swaps, option trading, all kind of that stuff. But now that is permissible, uh, permissive currently in Canada. Um, so obviously we're we're exploring what can be done in the future. Uh, so that would also be one thing for the other players to look at Canada is okay, you know there is a huge cost for compliance. So what's the revenue opportunities, right? If you only have the uh, spot. Um, it may not be balanced out. So I think that will be another uh, factor the newcomers will evaluate. Interesting. And maybe apart from, you know, we're, we spoke about regulators, but um, I would love to know your take on how maybe, you know, financial institutions view the rise of cryptocurrency or, you know, yeah, maybe the emergence of cryptocurrency within Canada. And uh, is there a possible collaboration between the two um, you know, maybe traditional financial institutions and crypto exchanges. Um, and what would that look like? Actually, that's a really good question. I I, I was uh, attending an event last night with KPMG uh, that literally talked about this topic. So that kind of got me triggered into that. Um, so I think the traditional financial institutions, uh, for them to hold crypto as a speculative asset, I would say that is still not very popular right now, right? So it's too volatile uh, for them as uh, any investment. However, there are a couple of use cases, I think at least two, that will be pretty attractive to them. So the first one is stable coins, right? So using stable coin as a payment tokens, trying to increase the speed of the payment across globe. I think that is being assessed by you know, payment service providers, uh, even by you know certain banks acting as stable coin custody. Like I think they're, quite a bit of discussion over there. So I think stablecoin, the rise of stablecoin, and the, if you look at their transaction amount, dollar value, or the number of transactions, it's actually astonishingly high. Like you're talking about, you can be comparable with PayPal, Visa, like all kind of that stuff, right? So I think this is a, and, and like it certainly is a, not a, a noticeable area. So the second thing I would say is the, the tokenized security token, right? So you're putting the real world assets on chain. You know, you're talking about putting, you know, the the I guess the the debt securities such as you know US bond, US treasuries. You know, you're talking about corporate bond putting on chain. We're seeing a huge increase recently when it comes to you know the real world assets on chain. Like you know, just seeing the last in 2023, like on the debt side, 
we're seeing like from $100 million from our beginning to now over $600 million, uh, $600 million. The total RWA assets there could be $3 billion, right? It's still relatively small, but, you know, considering, you know, the bond that, and also a lot of people now working on real estate, fractionized investment into real estate. I think this asset class in, in nature is more familiar with the traditional financial institutions. So mm-hmm. certainly interested in, you know, holding, investing, facilitating their users. But now it's really about what, how can we make sure that technology is fully ready? And in the meantime, the regulatory oversight can also be there to provide that comfort to the institutions. So I think stablecoin adoptions and real world asset adoptions will actually potentially uh, grow quicker uh, than just you know Bitcoin ETF investment. But obviously the crypto ETF and stuff like has been there for a long time. I'm still a firm belief that SEC has to approve what Bitcoin ETF very soon. Mm-hmm. They just have no choice. Uh, but when it comes to true financial institution adoption, I think the other two asset class will have higher chance to be like bigger adoption, I would say. Interesting. Um, and I guess my last question would be um, that what is next for you? What is next for Virgo CX? And uh, maybe if you could just provide maybe a brief summary of what you see in the future for crypto in Canada. Do you see more regulations, uh, more players moving into the market? What do you see? Um, yeah, like I think, first of all, from a Virgo CX side, our positioning is we will no longer just be a, you know, I guess exchange per se. Uh, we want to be a, you know, a comprehensive digital asset service provider. Uh, so that would include, you know, exchange. And we recently acquired an asset management company, uh, now rebranded to Virgo Asset Digital Asset Management, which we can provide, you know, crypto private fund, crypto separate manager accounts as well as in the future of crypto ETF, right? Providing the well solutions to the people that are needing it. Uh, and also we're looking at, you know, real world assets. What can we do with it, right? And uh, how can we kind of bridge that market needs, uh, you know, and make it, make sure that, you know, the circulation is fractionless and we create values for the ecosystem. So certainly we're definitely looking at, you know, all these components that are, this is a way we can make it compliant. Uh, and then we can be a more or less a comprehensive service provider. Uh, and also we're looking at international expansion too, right? So we already expand to Australia, US, looking at Hong Kong as well. So Hong Kong and the UK, United Kingdom as well. So obviously, you know, these regions, uh, we're hoping that by, you know, sometime next year, we can have a good presence over there. Uh, you know, so that we can be a little bit more, more or less a global organization on that front. Um, and uh, from a Canadian perspective, I think, you know, regulation definitely going to be tighter, <laughs> no doubt. Uh, but also in the meantime, we're just hoping that even with the tighter regulations, uh, there could be more business opportunities and business models that can be permitted within Canada, right? I think, you know, that will, we will need to achieve some kind of balance. Like you cannot just like have higher cost of you know regulatory oversight, but in the meantime you don't have any business opportunities, right? So I think that is something we definitely keep in mind, and also trying to work with regulators trying to achieve that balance. Um, so last, whether whether it's gonna be new people coming to Canada, yeah, I think ultimately it will because Canada is providing a much better regulatory oversight compared to US right now, definitely much better. Uh, but in the short term, I don't think so because the market is a little bit, you know, currently it's pretty suppressed. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also the, the barrier of entry is pretty high. <laughs> it's no longer like it's just easier like to do something in Canada. So I think it, we will need to go through that consolidated phase, getting things straightened out. And when the next bullish market comes, yeah, we will see what happened. Amazing. Um, Adam, I really want to thank you for your time today. This is such a complex topic and such an interesting one that people want to know about. So I'm happy that you were able to join us and, you know, answer so much about regulations, you know, what's happening in the industry, what trends you see, and obviously what the Virgo CX team is working on. And you have some cool stuff that you're working on with your team. So 
Thank you so much for joining us today. And I hope whoever listens to this episode can take a lot of knowledge from what Adam shared with us today. And yeah, please, if you have any questions for us or Adam, please do comment down below because learning about crypto and what's happening within the landscape is important. Uh, again, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Adam. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. That is our episode for today. I want to thank Adam Kai, the CEO of Virgo CX, for joining us today and providing his expertise. If you have any questions for us or Adam, please do comment them down below. If you enjoyed today's podcast, then please like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you so much for tuning into the Simplify Payments podcast presented by Paramount Commerce. I'm your host, Varad Mehta, and I'll see you soon. <laughs>